Hey, I'm Felissa Rose, and you're watching Keto and Crime. Hey everyone, welcome to Thought Crime and Keto and Crime. Today we are looking at the Health South accounting scandal. For those of you that do not know, Health South was once a huge chain of outpatient uh, clinics, outpatient surgery centers, and even a few regular acute care hospitals devoted to orthopedic surgery. Huge around the country. I, I had a, uh, a sonogram there that led me uh, to know that I needed my uh, gallbladder out. So I, I remember Health South very, very well. It was based in Birmingham, Alabama. It is now called Encompass Health. It's still around, though much smaller than it was during the height of its power. And what brought it down was a $4.6 billion accounting scandal along the same lines as WorldCom and Enron, Tyco, all those all those big scandals, and we're going to get into it today. Today is going to be a great show, and then my follow-up to this on Sunday will be an interview with former Health South CFO, Mr. Aaron Beam, who was the first CFO that was there during the, the scandal. He actually had a guilty conscience and left and eventually turned state's evidence against Health South and uh, served his time, gave back all the money he earned as a result of the crime. And is a uh, a really nice guy. I like him a lot. Uh, he has a lot of great things to say. He knows a lot. He travels around the country, lecturing on business ethics, and actually tells people in business school and accounting school not to let the pressure of making your Wall Street numbers and the pressure of an overzealous CEO leads you to do things that you wouldn't normally ethically do. So he has a really great message. And uh, so he was really nice enough to speak uh, for about 30 minutes with a uh, an unknown podcaster. So uh, thank you so much, Aaron. And that will be the second half of this. So please tune in for that. So let's get into it. Health South. To really understand Health South, you have to understand its founder, at least its main founder. Mr. Beam was also one of its founders, but to really understand the reasoning behind why the scandal took place, you have to go all the way back to August in 1952 in Selma, Alabama, to the birth of Richard Marin Scrooge, to a middle caste family in Selma, Alabama, a very poor community in southern Alabama. His father, Gerald, was a cash register repairman, and his mother, Gracie, was an RN and also a respiratory therapist. Um, Scrooge taught himself to play several musical instruments while growing up, so he always had an interest in music that will play in to some of the things he would do a little bit later on. He uh, did okay in high school, attended Parish High School in Selma, Alabama. Uh, but dropped out at the age of 17 because he got his high school girlfriend pregnant. And so by the time he was 20, he was living in a trailer park in Selma, trying to make ends meet, driving a cement truck to support his new family. His mother convinced him to go back to school. She said, you really need to get out of this rut. You don't need to get into being trapped into this job. There's so much you can do. So he quit his job with the cement factory, he got his GED, and he enrolled in the respiratory therapy program at Wallace State Community College in Dothan, Alabama. While at Dothan, he did earn his degree in respiratory therapy as well as his certificate. He did go on to UAB, University of Alabama at Birmingham, a very well-known medically-based university, and uh, completed an advanced degree in respiratory therapy. After achieving his advanced degree at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, Richard became a college-level instructor at UAB, and then later on at, back at Wallace State. It was during this time he divorced his first wife and um, kind of took on more of a bachelor lifestyle while wanting more. He knew that he wanted more than just 
being a respiratory therapist and teaching respiratory therapists, he knew big business was the way to go. So while at, UA, while at UAB and at Wallace teaching, he started perusing, looking for how he could move his degrees and move his experience into more of a management program. So he started looking for different jobs and actually kind of sold himself to a hospital group out of Texas. Lifemark was a huge hospital corporation. It ran mostly regular, what we know as regular acute care hospitals, but they wanted to expand into the growing day, day treatment um, phenomenon. You know, now you can go in and have surgery in a day and then come out and not have to stay in the hospital at all. So they, that was really on the move during this time. So Richard wanted to get in on that. So did Life March. So they kind of pinned Richard to help grow that part of their business. So he started looking into physical rehab centers, respiratory rehab centers, and basically just building that part of the business. First as director of acquisitions, where he helped buy up other small hospital chains and clinic chains, and eventually owned up at the age of 26 years old, one of the youngest C-level executives ever. He was named the ch company's chief operating officer or COO. However, while he was in the middle of buying up a huge rehab chain, it was announced to him that they were being bought by yet another hospital company called American Med Medical International. And there was going to be no room for uh, Richard. Because uh, when you have a merger of two large corporations, you have two CEOs, two COOs, two CFOs, and usually the person doing the buying, this case, American Medical International, usually keeps their C-level executives to the uh, detriment of everyone else. So he felt there was no room for him. While still at Lifemark, however, he hired a young accountant in uh, 1980 named Aaron Beam. And he and Aaron worked together quite closely. And when they realized that they were about to be sold, the two decided to venture out on them out on their own and do their own thing because lots of times during these hospital mergers you will have venture capitalists come at the executives of the company that's being bought because everyone knows that those are the executives kind of on their way out and they will approach them about perhaps an opportunity to build a new company from the from the ground up and this is what happened with Richard and Aaron they were approached by venture capitalists who pitched them the idea of starting their own company based on the rehab center and day surgery type center. So day surgery would be a little further out, but they kind of pop, you know, wanted a company centered on non-acute care hospitals. So not overnight stay hospitals, things where you could go in, get your testing, get your physical rehab, get everything you need in a day situation and then go home at night. And the two jumped on it. After a little bit of convincing, the two jumped on it. And Citicorp Venture Capital offered them $1, one million to help start their venture, in addition to the about $70,000 the two already had. And they started Amcare. They opened up their very first physical rehab center in Little Rock, Arkansas, in 1980. The facility in Little Rock was for physical rehab but it looked more like a gymnasium or a health spa than a hospital or any kind of acute care clinic. It was um, had lots of exercise equipment, lots of nice places to sit, so they were really on the cutting edge of what they thought the next generation of medical care was going to be. So from that one little clinic, they started to expand, founding other clinics in Birmingham and all around the South, eventually expanding into all 50 states, and they eventually changed their name to Health South, late 1980, from Amcare to Health South in late 1984. And by 1986, they had become a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange, which is highly unusual for a new startup company like that. In fact, from my research, it looked as though they were using Aaron Beam, who was the CFO at that time, was using very conservative accounting. You know, basically, revenue was revenue, expenses were expenses, liabilities were liabilities, assets were assets. Very clean, 
very conservative, very safe, how you want to be when you're a startup. However, it was, of course, showing that they weren't going to turn a profit for another couple of years. They were just kind of breaking even, maybe losing a tad bit, but not really, you know, wowing. So they weren't very attractive to Wall Street in 1984, 1985. However, 1986, Richard Scrooge, who had always been the chief of his tribe, got his got some advice from a Wall Street investment banker who wanted to help take the company live that they could increase their profitability, make themselves look profitable much sooner than they would normally be by doing some clever accounting. Now, because they were a medical company, medical companies deal a great deal with insurance. They deal with public insurance like Medicare and Medicaid. They also deal with private insurances. Think um, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Think uh, Kaiser Permanente. Think, think, and that's, think Cigna, Aetna. That's who they were dealing with. Now, when you take on a contract with any type of insurance, you are paid based on the contract that you negotiate up front with that payer. So basically, what a doctor or a clinic bills for a surgery, let's say you break your leg and you go to a Health South facility and you have rehab, you, let's say you they bill your insurance $10,000 for that therapy. The insurance is probably not going to pay that $10,000. They're probably going to pay somewhere in the neighborhood of six to $7,000 and they're going to write off the other three to four thousand dollars based on your contract. So a certain chunk of all revenues, all billable money that a medical facility bills out is written off per their contract with the insurance company. The insurance company won't pay it and they can't bill the patient with it because the insurance company has a contract with the patient saying they'll cover a certain amount. And then they turn around and have another contract with the medical provider saying we're going to pay X amount for this money, and that's all, you can't bill us, you can't bill our patients. So a certain amount of Health South and all medical revenue is written off. So in 1986, to make them look a little more attractive, what they decided to do was instead of saying they wrote off 15% of their revenue to insurance write-offs, they made that 13% or 12% or 10%. Not exactly fraud, but definitely creative accounting. Now, the major, the major fraud we're about to talk about started in 1996 when Health South was a huge company. The fraud, though, is said to have started, a certain amount of fraud is said to have started almost from the beginning. In 1986, a Health South facility in Bakersfield, California was accused of defrauding or overbilling Medicare for supplies used. In 1991, they had a similar bump with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama who did an audit saying they were being overbilled. So there was always a little bit of persnickiness there. But you know what? Because of the myriad of different pricing levels that exist within medical, within the medical genre, the industry really is rife for scandals because Sometimes profits for doctors and hospitals and clinics are razor thin. So they might bill an extra bandage or two to make a little bit more money. Uh, not exactly fraud, but if you do it on a large scale, you can get caught, which is what happened here. The insurance companies decided to do their own audit, and but that was kind of settled out of court. There was no charges ever brought. All right, so let's fast forward uh, a few years. You have Richard Scrooge and his team setting up a brand new corporate headquarters in Birmingham, Alabama, a huge campus. Uh, by the, at the height of the 90s, they employed over 50,000 people. And Richard Scrooge had put himself up as the apparent king of Health South. In fact, early in the development of Health South, when they only had like 15 people working at their corporate headquarters, Richard Scrooge actually drew a stick figure drawing of people with a wagon, some pulling a wagon, some pushing a wagon, some in a wagon, saying, basically, are you pulling the wagon? So basically, there was a understanding at Health South 
that you were expected to do whatever you could do to make the company grow and make the company better. And that was kind of the understanding. Every year they gave the, you know, the award to the best wagon puller. They got a little red wagon and a hundred shares of stock uh, to show that they were doing their part to move the company forward. And that was the kind of atmosphere that was fostered at HealthSouth. By 1997, they had over a hundred, they sold over 120,000 patients daily, made over $106 million in revenue in 1997. Richard Scrucci became the third highest paid CEO in the country. They were riding high, 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 high. So most people would say that little trick of under reporting what they wrote off for insurance reasons did them well because they were able to take those new numbers to Wall Street in the mid 80s. Richard Scrucci gave a rousing speech where actually Wall Street bankers got up and applauded him, which I don't know if that's a good sign or not, but let's just say they went public much earlier than they should have and became a Wall Street powerhouse. Everybody was saying growth, 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 growth. And from 1986, taking out their scuffles with the uh, Medicare and with the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, they went on a buying frenzy and started buying up other rehab and outpatient clinic uh, companies and grew to where they were one of the biggest in the world. And with over 2,000 facilities across the world, they began to attract hugely popular orthopedic surgeons and other medical professionals. They attracted the likes of Shaquille O'Neal, Jack Nicholas, Michael Jordan to do their sports medicine procedures with them. Sports medicine became huge for HealthSouth. And let's just say they painted themselves into both a corner and also put themselves out there as one of the greatest healthcare companies ever. Each year, Wall Street gave them street predictions of what they thought the Health South earnings should look like. And each year, Health South managed to make those until 1996, when the actual fraud we're going to talk about began. It became quite apparent to Aaron Beam, the CFO at the time, and his chief accountant, Bill Owen, who actually had at one point worked for their auditor, Ernest & Young. They didn't use Arthur Anderson. I know when we talked about Enron and uh, WorldCom, which I'll link those videos up here, they used uh, Arthur Anderson. But HealthSouth actually used Ernest & Young, one of the other big five accounting firms. And Bill Owen, who was the chief accountant, would later be one of the CFOs that turned state's evidence, used to work for Ernest & Young, so he kind of knew how they operated. And he and Aaron Beam together discovered, 1996, we're not going to make these Wall Street numbers. We are not going to make them. We're going to come in short, and there's nothing we can do. They couldn't use the just what I would call liberal accounting methods they had been using before. It was bad. So they actually went to Richard Scrucci and told him, we're not going to make our numbers. We need to put out a statement saying we had a bad quarter, whatever you want to do, but we're not going to make these numbers. Richard Scrucci said, absolutely not. Richard Scrucci was the type of person that ran his country like a dictator, like a monarch. He was having none of that. He said, you're going to destroy us all. We all make good salaries. We have private jets. We are enjoying a rock star lifestyle here in the small city of Birmingham, Alabama which was not true. They had two Gulfstream jets they were flying around in. They had, you know, standing reservations at any restaurant in town. All of the brass at Hell South were living like rock stars, and they didn't want to give that up. So he started kind of dangling that over their head. In addition, Scrucci had gotten real accustomed to using the company's money to fund his own interests, such as playing in a rock and roll band called Proxy at company events and other places. And later on, when that didn't pan out, he went to Nashville and started his own uh, country band called Dallas County Line. He even had a uh, song called Honk, If You Love Honky Tonk. If you love to honky tonk. Oh, 
think I just fell in love. Yeah, let's listen to that again. Give your love to the honky tonk. Not exactly boot scootin' boogie, is it? But he used company money to fund these sort of things. And as a result, he got real accustomed to that lifestyle. So he kind of put the pressure on Aaron Beam and Bill Owen to make this work, whatever you have to do. So Bill Owen said, look, I know what Ernest Young's going to look for. They ignore any general ledger. And general ledger is just an entry of all your accounting you know, transactions, whether it's debit or credit, they ignore any transaction under a certain amount of money. I know that threshold. And so what I can do is add in revenue to the books under that set amount and make our incoming money, our accounts receivable, look better and debit assets over here that don't really exist. So it's not going to actually affect our ongoing balance sheet. So what he was doing is adding money they never took in in small enough increments that Ernest and Young, their auditor, would not notice it. Over here, he was basically inventing assets they didn't have and debiting from those so it wouldn't affect their actual assets. So they put their heads together and decided this is what they were going to do. And it was at that point, according to Aaron Beam and Bill Owens and later on Weston Smith, Another CFO, Richard Scrucci, said, if we ever get caught, I'm going to deny that this ever happened. I'm going to deny any knowledge of it. It's all going to be on y'all. Y'all do what y'all need to do to make us make our numbers. I'm going to deny any knowledge of it. So basically, according to Aaron Beam, he went home. Bill Owen went back to his office and essentially cooked the books, and they made their numbers in 1996. But if, and this went on from 1996 until it all started to fall apart in 2002. In early 1997, uh, Aaron Beam retired, part, mostly because of the fraud. He just didn't want to be a part of it anymore. And they had a succession of four different CFOs that took over, and they continued to do the same thing. A lot of them had been, most of them had been with Help South their whole lives. They weren't their whole major career lives. They never hired a CFO outside of Health South. They always promoted from within because, again, Scrooge had kind of fostered that atmosphere of we're a team and we do whatever it is to pull this wagon forward. So he kind of had set them up for keeping their mouth shut. And so that kind of went on until 2003, when if you look at the actual numbers of Help South, you'll see in the early days, they just, you know, kind of embellished it by about 50%. By the end of the fraud, it was like 4,000% that they had kind of hid losses and exaggerated gains. Two thousand two, due to the fact that a greater control was coming over Wall Street because you had the Tyco scandal, you had WorldCom, you had Enron. All of that really affected how government monitored Wall Street. So you had a brand new bill put into effect in 2002 called Surveillance-Oxley. And basically it was named after the two senators that wrote it, that sponsored the bill into law. Basically it said that chief financial officers had to sign off on their reports to Wall Street, indicating that those numbers were accurate and true. This has not been the case anywhere previously on Wall Street. They could just publish their numbers, and if it passed their auditors, which Health South was passing their audits because the fraud was in small enough increments that nobody paid any attention to them. So by 2002, when this bill was signed into law, now you had... CFOs that actually had to put their own name on it and become personally liable for it, they didn't like that. They knew that Richard Scrooge was going to deny knowledge. So what happened? You had a whistleblower in the person of Weston Smith, the current CFO. 
who basically called the SEC and tipped them off. It was no time that the FBI raided Health South uh, headquarters in Birmingham, took over all their books, and uncovered what amounted to be about $4.6 billion in fraud, and it, at least part of that was a $2.7 billion exaggeration in profits, which helped them maintain their standing on Wall Street, their stock price, which is where everybody got their wealth from. You remember that? Same thing with Enron. They all got their wealth based on that stock price, their stock options. So, Basically, February 6, 2003, FBI began that criminal investigation. At that point, Aaron Beam and some of the other CFOs came forward, turned state's evidence, told them everything they knew. They all put forth their own personal balance sheet showing how they had profited from stock options and stuff and basically had to pay all that back to the government or basically left with maybe a, a roof over their head and a car to drive, they all had to get new careers, but they agreed to turn state's evidence against Scrooge, who denied, did just what he said he would do, do and denied any knowledge of it, and basically said that they were liars. So they agreed that the FBI wanted Scrooge, so they cut all of these other CFOs kind of a deal. They didn't get no time. They had all had to serve time. They all had to pay back all the money they had profited from the scandal. But they did testify against Scrooge. Now, in the interim, before his trial, Scrooge and his third wife decided that they were going to get the community, the Birmingham community, on their side. Religion's very important in Birmingham. It's also a majority African-American city. So Scrooge went out and joined a couple of African-American churches. He bought a local television network and started putting on his own version of Trinity Broadcasting. We'll take a look. Hello and welcome to Viewpoint. We've got a wonderful show for you today. We're good friends. We've got a great scripture. We're going to be continuing. And started preaching around churches, getting the community on his side. You had pastors come out for him saying he was a good Christian man. But these CFOs had done all of this on their own. They signed the Sarbanes-Oxley thing. They did it all on their own. And that he was an innocent victim of unscrupulous employees. He knew nothing about it even though he ran Health South with an iron iron hand, but yet when it comes to the fraud, he knew nothing about it. That dog don't hunt. But he got the community on his side. And during the trial, federal prosecutors originally indicted Scrooge on 85 counts of fraud and intent to mislead investors. By the end of his trial in 2005, he had had that reduced down to 36 charges and was found not guilty on every single one of them. Why, you might ask, because the trial took place in Birmingham. He had truly hypnotized and gotten on his side the churches of Birmingham and their demonstrations, the fact that all the jurors were religious people, he got acquitted. And when jurors were actually polled, they said that to them, it seemed that the CFOs were a bunch of liars, whereas Scrooge was a good Christian man that was telling the truth. And it seemed that the defense attorneys, Shushi's attorneys, during the trial tried to put forth that very thing. When they got the CFOs on the stand, they basically drilled them, brought out the fact some of them had, had extramarital affairs, things that ignore the fact that Scrooge himself had, was on his third wife, um, and basically did their job of getting their client off, no matter what the truth was, and made the CFOs out to be liars. The CFOs, depending on how long they had known about the fraud, were sentenced from anywhere to three months. Aaron Beam did three months in a federal minimum security prison up to 10 years for Weston Smith. So, yeah, they all, they all served their time. They all paid back their money. Scrooge went on to bigger and better crimes because a few years later he was indicted again by the federal government for supposedly bribing a former governor of Alabama by the, by the name of Don Siegelman. I won't go into that because I don't know what happened there. 
but he was convicted of that and ended up serving seven years for that crime, though he did nothing criminally for the Health South. However, he did end up paying $180 million in damages back to investors, thanks to local Birmingham attorney Doug Jones, who is now a senator from Alabama, a Democratic senator from Alabama, filing a class action lawsuit against Mr. Scrooge. He was, of course, fired from Health South. Health South has now officially rebranded as Encompass Health and is still running their outpatient clinics across the country. So that's the story of Health South. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was a good primer for my conversation with former Health South CFO Aaron Bean, which will be coming up next time. Thanks again. If you want to support the channel, links are below. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Thanks so much, guys. One um, today we've got a special treat. We've got um, Aaron Beam, former CFO of Health South. He has been gracious enough to join us and kind of give us a uh, insider's look at the Health South account accounting scandal. Um, welcome, Aaron. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, I was a founder of Health South and uh, was the CFO uh, for 13 years and. Uh, I was involved in the accounting fraud, which, and it's kind of hard to say when a fraud actually begins. Uh, we were probably doing some things that were quasi-fraudulent uh, almost from day one, but the out and out just making up numbers and literally cooking the books began in 1996. In fact, the second quarter of 1996. And that's been pretty much documented, but, in a lot of different ways. So uh, while some people claim we had phony books from day one, uh, most experts say it in 96. Now, I left in 97, so I, I only participated in the fraud for a few months, and uh, the fraud went on until 2003. So, um, but my significant role was that it did begin on my watch, uh, I worked for Richard Scrooge even before we started the company. And so I, when I wrote my book about Health South, I felt like I was one of the better qualified people to, to write about how the fraud took place and all that. But in reality, a lot of the details of how the accounting and how the fraud unraveled over a six or seven year period, I don't have a lot of firsthand knowledge on that. Definitely. I, I understand that. I, I really just wanted your take on it and what you know and what you saw and what you're allowed to tell us. And um, I know you had well, a long I, I, As long as I'm telling the truth, I think I can tell you anything. Uh, <laughs> if I start lying to you, then I, I, I might be creating problems for myself and others. But everything I, I say in my book and in my speeches is, is, is the truth. And it's... Uh, uh, it, it happened just like I said it happened. Definitely. I know you started uh, with uh, Mr. Scrooge way back in, what, 1980? We started the company in 84. 84. Okay. okay. Went public in 86. All right. And uh, you were the CFO from the start? You've read my book, you say? I, I have. And I've also listened to just about every speech Hello? I can find of yours on YouTube. Uh-oh. Where'd you go? Can you hear me? I can hear you. You, you kind of froze there for a second. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I've, I've read your book and I've listened to just about everything I can find of you on YouTube while researching the case. And I uh, okay. uh, just had a few questions. Um, sure. I know you said that Mr. Scrooge could be kind of overbearing, kind of scary. You said he carried a weapon in his briefcase and had bodyguards. Did, did you and... Um, your uh, accountant at the time, uh, did Bill Owen, did you to kind of feel strong armed into doing what you did with uh, kind of I, cooking the book, so to speak? I think Richard had the unique ability of intimidating people uh, just through his character and, and his mannerisms and everything. Um, you know, I don't, he seldom ever said, uh, you know, I'm going to harm you bodily if you just don't do these things but uh 
you still got the impression that he might <laughs> right <laughs> without him even saying it so he he was the kind of person that you you uh literally uh, feared uh, i think maybe i could sum it up very well when when i wrote my book uh, hell south the wagon to disaster i was on a radio talk show in birmingham and talking about the book and i was in town doing a book signing and a lady called in she said mr beam you probably don't remember me but i used to work for you at hell south she says i worked in the uh, accounts payable department and she said occasionally i would have to take very large checks into mr scrushy's office for him to sign and she said as soon as i walked into his office i began to tremble and i was just uh she said he had the eyes of a reptile and he was just scary to be around so he he, he had that ability to, to intimidate people uh, and he knew he had that ability and he used it uh whenever he could i i in all my research on white collar especially counting scandals that mm -hmm. seems to be a common denominator uh with health south with worldcom with bernie eppers with ken lay at enron they were all very intimidating people and it seemed yeah, like that, yep. they ran their company like a dictatorship almost it, it's true it's true and there's been a lot written about it uh a professor at arizona state university wrote a book that seven signs of ethical collapse and the book was about enron worldcom tyco health south and a couple of other companies and one of the seven signs was that they all had bigger than life intimidating uh, CEOs who uh, totally measured success by how much money they could accumulate. And that was all that was important to them. So when you see these kinds of massive frauds that are become so large and go on for years, there's usually a retro scrushy type person at the center. So you, you've done your research yeah oh well i can tell you from what i understand the when you first started doing what you called creative accounting in the in the 80s even before the yeah. 96 file out you were simply doing what a lot of accountants do they move numbers around a little bit they kind of thread out projections a little bit which is not illegal it's not a scam a lot of companies do it well yeah uh, in accounting there's a lot of things you have to estimate uh you know you have to estimate the life of your assets you have to estimate what you think your revenue collections are going to be so you have gray areas and the danger though is that you if you always do your accounting so that it helps the short-term bottom line in other words every every accounting change every adjustment you make is to help the bottom line and you ignore generally accepted accounting principles probably that's there's nothing in the law that says you can't do that but common sense would tell you that if you're building a bridge or something and you always cut corners and you buy the the you never buy the top of the grade materials you just do things to get by uh, one day that bridge might fall down and it's kind of the same with accounting if you always uh, do creative accounting to create earnings over time that really weakens your financial statements definitely well you can see that in the projections on the actual like when in 96 when you said the actual cooking of the books actually started you can see charts that kind of show it going from oh a 50 percent discrepancy up to 200 percent and then by 2003 it was at like 2000 percent overstatement i mean it just grew uh, yeah, yeah. Well, let me give an example of, and, and, and while I don't know that much about the details of the accounting, uh, but I've been told by Weston Smith, who was there the entire time, uh, our outpatient centers and surgery centers, the medical supply inventory in reality was a few thousand dollars, two, three, four thousand dollars. As the fraud grew and we created phony earnings, we had to debit something on the balance sheet to offset that over time that three four five thousand account grew to ten thousand then twenty thousand then a hundred thousand 
so uh, you know it it uh, it ballooned as it went on. It really did. Definitely. Well, I, 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 maybe a lot of people don't realize is that when you're I've, I've done medical insurance coding, and I know that when you that what a doctor charges an insurance company is not what they get paid. You have a, no, a certain no. amount you have to write off. You have a copay, a deductible that has to be met, and then there's always a, a huge amount that just has to go away because you can't charge the due to your contract with that particular health insurance company, whether it's right. public or private. You have to write off a huge chunk of money. You can't right. charge that to the patient. So. Right. You were you started out, I know in eighty six kind of okay, maybe we lose ten percent of our revenue to the write off, but then you started moving around, maybe it's eight percent. Right, exactly. And then that escalated into ninety six where basically Bill Owen had worked for Ernest Young and said that, okay, I know what level of entries on general ledgers that they actually look at. And so mm -hmm. at that point, Scrooge ordered you guys to start putting in those entries and those amounts that wouldn't, mm -hmm. that would kind of escape the scrutiny of the auditors. Is that kind of mm -hmm. how it started? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's really out, out and out fraud when you start just making totally uh, incorrect entries, knowing that the auditors aren't going to look at them. I mean, you're, you're, you're committing fraud. There's no doubt about it. Uh, you're not changing accounting estimates or anything like that. It's, you you really understand the healthcare industry well, I can tell. One of the healthcare companies, particularly for profit healthcare companies, have had a, a, a history of bad accounting. And it's because of the complexity of healthcare accounting. N nobody understands it. Uh, if you stay in a hospital for a few days, you get home and you, they send you your bill, you can't make heads or tails out of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just can't understand it. So that in itself makes for um, it makes it suspect to, to manipulation because it's so confusing. It's not like you go to a grocery store and a loaf of bread is a dollar twenty, and you walk down to the next grocery store and it's a dollar ten, and you can quickly see what's going on. You can't do that in healthcare. Oh yeah, um, it's, yeah. It, it's and then. Um, so that that's 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 part of the problem. The other thing that plays into it is that when you're a very large company and we were a multi-billion-dollar company, uh, auditors look at materiality, and if things are relatively small and for a billion-dollar company, that might be a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, three hundred thousand dollars. They can actually sort of pass on that because it's not material when you compare it to the whole scope of the company. So that, the complexity of healthcare accounting, uh, all those things um, make for healthcare companies to be right for fraudulent accounting. For sure. And a lot of people don't, don't realize if you contract with, I think Medicare's rates are pretty standard. Medicaid's rates are pretty standard. But if you, with contracts with certain providers, but if you're talking about a Blue Cross or a Kaiser Permanente or any other private insurance company out there, their contract with Health South has a different fee structure than their than their uh, contract with um, Vanderbilt or UAB or or somebody or like whatever, that or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, um, that's uh, people. A lot of times will ask me during Q&A and all just curious that uh, what do I think can be done to improve health care uh, in the United States you know it seems like it's broken nobody's happy with it we're always trying to change it and I always come back with uh, transparency and pricing mm -hmm. uh, make it so that people can understand the pricing and I believe we have the computers and the technology now to do that. When we can learn that a little old lady in Montana's cat had kittens yesterday, uh, you can't tell me that we can't make pricing transparent. Uh, it's just that I don't think it's in the interest necessarily of the hospitals or the insurance companies or other people 
to do that. They they kind of like the way the game is played. And, uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned that. It's even President Trump and a lot of people have said, we got to have transparency in pricing, but I don't see much happening to really make it uh, come forth, you know? So. Well, me either. I, and I agree with you. I think transparency in pricing and also insurance companies are the reason the prices got so high to begin with. Yeah, exactly. 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 I mean, I remember when I was young, my mom taking me to the doctor and just paying cash yeah. and she oh, yeah. to do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm older than you, I'm sure. But same thing with me. We went to the, my doctor's office. Mm -hmm. He had a nurse and it was him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And that was it. He didn't have a big staff of people or anything. And uh, he told you when you left that you owed five, ten dollars and you paid it. And it was it was very easy to understand, you know. Yeah. And you could call him and ask him, what will you charge to deliver my baby? And he would tell you, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's it, when insurance got involved, it became really wacky, and uh, and it's just gotten worse. So. And it, it spiraled. I mean, you have look at a farm, look at big pharma, look at you know oh, yeah, yeah. Martin Scarelli and all those guys. How they're able to jack up drug prices? It's all the same thing. There's no transparency. We don't know no, right. what it right. actually costs to make the drug, what it actually costs to research the drug. We're just we just pay what we're given, you know. It's just kind of turning into a healthcare conference rather than. A I'm sorry. <laughs> problem. No, that's okay. That's okay. I enjoy talking about this. Uh, um, I'll I'll drive it back yeah. on point. Um, do you mind okay. talking about Mr. Scrooge at all? I I don't. I mean, in my book, you know, the last paragraph of my book, I said I'm sure he's going to sue me for writing this book. He hasn't. Um, and, and I don't want to just keep beating a dead horse, and I, I don't want people to think that I'm not at fault in what happened, that Scrooge made me do it, Scrooge's the bad guy, I'm the good guy. Uh, with Hell South should have been the one to stand up to Richard and look out and do the right thing, and I didn't do it. So um, bless his heart, he, he had his problems, I had my problems, uh, beating up on him even more. Um, I don't. I don't care to do that. I understand, sir. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to put you in a in a predicament there. No, 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 no. no. Uh, well, I mean, I could go on and on and tell you story after story about Scrooge that are really interesting, but uh, we'll save that for another day. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> um, well, I know that. Um, of course, as we all know, he was bigger than life. He kind of wielded power over the company and stuff. But I think one thing that didn't really come clear to me is the board, the board of directors, um, did they never like realize maybe something was going on and decide to step in? Did anybody on the board ever challenge him or challenge what was going on? Well, here again, I left uh, in 97 and the fraud went on for many years. And so I can't really talk much about what the board did or didn't do in those other years. But I know Richard, handpicked his board he 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 liked yes men he didn't like did not like board members to disagree with him at all and he was a master at, at getting that done I, I will tell you a story that's i think kind of telling we had just raised our first round of venture capital and got the company started we had a, a small board of directors and it came time for our first annual review and Richard had agreed to take a very modest salary when he started the company. And at the board meeting, at the first annual board meeting, uh, he asked for a big, big raise. And they told him no, you know, they weren't going to do it. And he walked out of the boardroom, just walked out of the boardroom. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. And um, they finally got him back in the boardroom and he said, look, guys, I'm going to run this company. I'm going to make everybody a lot of money and you're going to pay me what I want to be paid or I'm out of here. And you need to understand that. He talked to him just like that, you know, and they wow. gave him the raise. <laughs> 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 wow. And as the years went by, he gave them raises. He gave them stock options. He let them ride in the company airplanes and uh, they, they became totally, 
you want to say addicted to the whole program. Uh, they understood that it, it was better to play ball with him than to fight him because if you fought him, you weren't going to win. He had a neat way of always asking things. He would always say if he wanted something, he'd propose it to the board and he would say, don't you guys think this is something we should do? <laughs> and he did it all the time. You know, he'd, get, he'd call me in and say, Aaron, here's something I think we should do. What do you think? Well, you're set up. You know not to say, no, I don't agree with you, Richard. You're, you're, you don't want the hell beat out of you. So you say, yeah, I, I think that's a good idea, Richard. <laughs> I know a lot of people, especially on, on videos like this where I, I talk about white collar crime, I get a lot of comments that talk about how all these people are evil and they're corporate machines and stuff like that. And I, I'm going to say that I don't necessarily agree with that. I think you and your staff were in a very difficult position. And also probably Mr. Scrooge himself, he probably deep down thought that the company could make up those numbers because you were growing so fast. Right, right, right. And, and when he told that board... I'm going to make you a lot of money. I'm going to run this company. I started this company and I'm going to make it a giant success. He meant it with all of his heart. Mm -hmm. and, and he wanted them to give him what he wanted, you know? So um, that's just the way he was, you know? Because right. y'all uh, were planning what, acute care hospitals, like regular? Uh, we had a few acute care hospitals that were, that were special, that specialized in orthopedic surgery, like okay. in Birmingham. Okay. But generally we did not, uh, just go by a run-of-the-mill hospital. Right. We had about five acute care hospitals, but they all had prominent orthopedic surgeons practicing there. Well, I remember when I lived in Birmingham, there was like, it was just after all this went down, but there had been like a plan for a really state-of-the-art Health South uh, hospital on maybe two, Highway 280? Yes. Near yes, the Galleria? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, out by our corporate office, and uh, uh, were you in, did you tell me you actually had an office in the South Building at one time? I did, uh, right uh, right there at the Fountain Building. Um, I worked for Virginia College, another company yeah. with a scandalous history that recently went out of business, but I, I worked there for their online division, and uh, my office was there. Okay, them. did you know a Greg Womble? Greg Womble? Womble. He worked for uh, an education type company in that building. His office is in that building, and it was. Uh, I know he was concerned about some of the things they were doing. He yeah, was a, like a technical writer for them. Yeah, Education right. Corporation of America. I worked for them, but I, I worked for another division of theirs called Virginia okay. College, and okay. uh, they kept corporate and branches kind of divided. So I, I probably wouldn't have known yeah. him, but it sounded. Yeah. Known him. yeah. Yeah. But I left like you. I left way before anything kind of <laughs> kind of went down. So, yeah. but um, yeah. but that's a lot of pe most people that get involved in these frauds. I think they they think their company can make up the difference, and it's not going to be oh, a yeah. big deal. Oh yeah, yeah. and uh, you know it's um, I, I I use you probably have heard this one before the frog in boiling water. Mm -hmm. if, if you put a frog in a pot of really hot water, he'll jump right out. But if you put him in a pot of water and slowly 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 raise the temperature he eventually does die mm -hmm. and that's what happens so you 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 start these kinds of things the pressure of wall street to make your numbers you don't want to be a loser you don't want stockholders to lose money and out of good intentions you become a little more creative than you should be it's that simple you know it, it is uh, it's, it's, there aren't that many people that just go out there and say, ha, huh, today I think the way to make money is just to commit huge frauds. You know, it just doesn't start that way. It starts. No, it's just like, like my like, grandfather, who was yeah, a farmer, yeah. said, prime the pump. It's, it, it's corporate's way of priming the pump. you got to <laughs> put stuff in to get, it, get the water out, you know? Yeah, yeah. Where are you from originally? Uh, originally a little town called Gadsden, Alabama, not far from uh, yeah, Birmingham. Yes. Okay. Well, you're an Alabama girl. And you do stand up comic, huh? I do. I do. That's a brave thing to do. 
Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm usually petrified when I get on stage. It, once I get up there and get one laugh, I'm okay, but I'm usually nervous before I get up there. I, um, you probably have heard some of my talks. I put humor into my speeches. You do. It, it works well when, it, like, you, if you can get the audience laughing, you, you know you're there they're engaged so uh, i think it's important I, I think i'd be a bad just stand-up comedian though I, I carefully weave my humor into my presentation it's not they don't even realize i'm trying to be funny at times you know well there's a there's a division a, a sect of stand-up comedy called storytelling and you would be absolutely perfect for that you just tell stories okay. like yeah, you do and you yeah. weave humor into it yeah i can do that i can do yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> But um, from from talking to you and listening and reading your book, I I came to the impression that you left in '96 because you want, uh, wanted to retire. You kind of were wary. You said that you didn't. You felt like you were trying to put a genie back in a bottle after that yeah, started. Yeah, yeah. So you just kind of wanted to get away from it. Exactly. And then Mr. Scrucci asked you to rejoin the company in the early 2000s, and you refused. Uh, he, just one year after I left, he asked mm -hmm. me to rejoin. Yeah. Was and it I because you were afraid that the fraud was still going on or you just really settled into retirement at that point? No, it was, it was more I just settled into retirement. Even without the fraud, I wasn't that happy of a camper uh, dealing with Wall Street and the pressures of being a public company. Um, it, 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 it was, um, it, it's a tough job, you know, like I say, it, it's, uh, being the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, CFO is not a not an easy job. So, I made a lot of money, and um, I just felt like it was time to leave the game. Now, the first time we cooked the books in 1996, Richard promised Bill Owens and I that I'm going to start selling off airplanes. I'm going to cut costs. We're going to get our costs in line, and uh, we're we're going to get out of this hole and just hang in there, guys. Let's do this this one time. Well, he didn't live up to any of those promises. He bought more airplanes. He spent more money on his band, uh, you know, doing silly things that just uh, benefited Richard Scrucci. So th that was another reason I, I wanted to leave. Uh, once he welched on those promises that day, I said, no, I can't. I'm not going to stay here and just have him lie to me again and again and again. Yeah, because, well, he had already told you guys he was going to deny deny any knowledge of what was he, going on yeah the, the second time we cooked the books maybe or you know, the third time third quarter he he did he said if, if we're caught i'm going to deny everything and that was another reason why i said no nah, <laughs> his interests my interests are not in line at all yeah well for those of my viewers that don't know i mean they would have already seen my presentation by now so they'll know that you were one of the five cfos that testified against him at his trial you were one of the ones that actually turned yourself in basically you were oh yeah I did. I did. Yeah. and uh you faced the piper um yeah. and you pretty much had to pay back all your gains from I did. from I the did. fraud i did and uh the way my attorney explained it to me he said they'll look at your personal balance sheet and they're going to take nearly all of it and he said that they won't put you in a box underneath the freeway and they won't ask you to pay stuff that you just can't pay but whatever you're capable of paying they're going to ask for it and, that, and that's what they did and so once everything went down I had to auction off my home in Fairhope Alabama and pay restitution pay legal fees and uh, uh, start a new life essentially well, you've done, you've, you seem to be doing real well. I see that you're busy as public speaking. You still have your landscaping business? Oh, no, no, no. I, I, I did landscaping for two years. Uh-oh, did I lose you? No, I'm here. Okay, my, my screen went blank. But uh, I did mow lawns for two years, and uh, as my speaking started picking up, I, I really couldn't do both, and I just quit. I was getting fifty dollars or so to mow a lawn, and I was getting maybe a thousand dollars to give a speech. So, I said, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and it's air conditioned when you give a speech, so I opted yes. to get out of the landscape business. Don't blame you at all. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I think 
probably the last thing of interest about this case is just the public relations machine that he was able to put on during his trial. I remember, oh, yeah. I remember seeing him on local television uh, preaching uh, basically a, a, mi a miniature Trinity broadcasting network is what he had going on. Yeah. And just using that influence of the, especially the, the African American churches in Birmingham for public, the public to get behind him and got found. Their defense made you guys out to be the bad guys. You were lying. Y'all didn't know what you were talking about. You were trying to blame this innocent guy. And yet he somehow came out unscathed for that. It's just. Well, it, it, it through this whole experience, it became, I now totally realized that defense attorneys aren't seeking justice. They aren't looking for truth. They have one job, keep their client out of jail. Mm -hmm. And they primarily do it by discrediting those who testify against their client. The O.J. Simpson thing, they put the Los Angeles Police Department on trial. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, but that's just typical. That particularly if, if you're part of the crime, the defense attorneys are going to say, here's a bunch of felons, people who admitted that they were guilty, they're sleazeballs, and they're trying to get their jail time to increase by ratting out an innocent man. And the jurors bought into it. So yeah. what can you do? <laughs> That's what gets every single one of these big cases that involve these big, big name CEOs, Richard Scrooge. Bernard Eppers, Ken Lay, yeah. that was always their defense. They, sure. they ran their companies with an iron fist up until the point of the fraud, then they knew nothing about it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It made no sense. Exactly. Yeah, no, no, it made no sense. And, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, the courtroom is a very interesting place. And uh, you really don't want to have to go into court with a jury uh, you don't have to because it, it, it gets down to how the lawyer spin everything and it, it may just it just may not work out like it should you know as in the case of the Scrooge trial so then when he was found guilty for bribing the governor governor Sigelman uh, he wasn't he didn't praise the jury he said oh they got it wrong this time <laughs> oh yeah he made this documentary that I watched that was like had everybody, including the president of um, Alabama Power on there, talking about how this was just the government's witch hunt against Richard Scrooge. They failed to get him on the Help South thing. So now they're trying to get him on this. Oh, yeah. It wasn't a bribe yeah. and all this stuff. Yeah. yeah. I don't know anything about yeah. it. I just know they found him guilty, but I just yeah. thought it was interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about I really, he may have been innocent of the bribe to the government. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Absolutely. We, we uh, don't know. We don't know what went on there. Net, net, he got a lot less jail time for bribing the governor than he would have if he had been guilty of the health stuff. Probably. Definitely. Definitely. So, anyway. Well, one thing I'm going to tell my subscribers. Well, this has been great. Yeah. I'm a huge I'll fan of yours, sir. When do you, uh, do you ever present? I, well, thank you. Uh, do you ever do comedy in Birmingham? I do occasionally. When I do, I'm at Stardome occasionally. I'll send you a, I'll let you yeah, know. Send I'll send you tickets. Yeah. I'm going to be in town uh, March the 13th. In fact, I have reservations at Highlands Bar and Grill, and uh, I'll be, be there. And uh, if you were in town, I might want to kind of catch your show. Okay. Uh, if, if I'm performing, I can, I'll certainly. I can maybe make a I can make a trip up to Birmingham to hear you. I'd like to hear you. All can right. I heckle you from the crowd? Do you sure. like people to heckle you when you're... <laughs> hey, you can heckle me. I'll bring you up on stage and make you tell some stories. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, everybody, I want you to know that this man, I've watched so much that he's done, and he always ends his speeches by telling MBAs and accounting hopefuls not to compromise their ethics to please the CEO. And I think that's great that you do that, yep. sir. Well, okay. Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate you um, being so knowledgeable about all of this. And uh, let's do it again sometime, okay? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Bean. You have a good night. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>